You know, there's a 93% chance that if more people knew about our channel, they'd probably give us just as much flack as they do AWS F1 Insights. If you followed this 2020 season closely, you've actually seen quite a lot of AWS F1 Insight graphics coming up and people absolutely are split on them. Some people really like it, some people are just genuinely against it. So let's talk a little bit about the use of artificial intelligence and how it found its way into Formula One. So if we want to talk about artificial intelligence in Formula One, there's a couple of things that we got to look back into the history of Formula One. So Formula One is one of the very different series than all of the other motorsports out there in the sense that they are not a equal and fair treatment to all teams. So motorsports has several series that you have to run the same engines, the same chassis, very little that you could do. So that way it is the driver that it becomes the big differentiator on who performs best and you see in several different series formula 2 and formula 3 are great examples several american series are, are good examples as well where you're limited to what you can do in improving the performance of your car in order to gain an advantage where formula 1 has always taken an exact opposite and one of the interesting things although sometimes it can lead to boring supremacies like mercedes has for the past seven years is the fact that you get the absolute best within a set of regulations and artificial intelligence is one of the things that just like everything else in formula one has come about in trying to get the utmost best out of their machinery and if you look at it today a it is said that a standard formula one car has enough sensors that in a given race weekend, it'll generate 50 to 70 gigs worth of data. That's 50 to 70 gigabytes worth of data, which is a ton of data. And all of this is used in live, real stream motion in order to understand what's happening with the car and try to make predictions if there are certain things that you should do, whether it's tune down an engine to try to save it or in, increase your pace in order to be able to undercut or overcut someone in a pit stop. It is simply fascinating the amount of work that goes into artificial intelligence. And what we're looking at with AWS bringing in on board a lot of these graphics is a glimpse with the information that's provided to them by Formula One into what teams are currently using to make their decisions. Now, there's a couple of things we'll go into and try to understand how AWS is using this data, but whether you're on the pro side or against side of using the artificial intelligence, it is just one way of showing the spectator how far these teams can go today in order to be able to get the utmost uh, performance out of their cars. So if we look at what AWS F1 Insights has, we're going to take a look particularly in their qualifying pace because anybody that's followed us long enough knows that we're actually also trying to use artificial intelligence in our own way to predict qualifying results and race results. So one of the big things that AWS has done in partnering with Formula One is gathering quite a bit of information to be able to make these predictions. Now in particular, trying to understand the exact pace advantage that a driver may have from free practice. Now if you're looking at me and saying, Eric, your video is garbage because everyone knows that nobody shows their full pace in free practice, you're not that far off. However, the interesting thing about artificial intelligence is the fact that artificial intelligence is there to look at trends. And if you have enough drivers going around enough laps, you can look into particular trends to understand when they're pushing and when they're not pushing. And you do that enough times around a circuit, enough times around a year, and you can start kind of deducting and having an idea of where the real pace is at and that is what AWS has set out to do. So what they're looking at is some very basic information such as driver, circuit, constructor, and weather information and they're also trying to use a couple of assumptions that Formula One has helped them which go along with tire grip and fuel loads. So for example if you're looking at an F 
FP1 and FP2 session, those are usually sessions notorious for being more on race pace testing and running all the different programs. Drivers can run multiple different programs on the same team. They can divide and conquer all the programs that they need to run to see what their race pace is like. But FP3 is more commonly known as the free practice session that you're trimming it out for qualifying pace. So there is a lot that kind of goes into consideration where you can run different models to make your predictions. And Amazon F1 Insights has actually admitted that they go down to a very granular level to the point that they're looking at actual sector times to be able to help understand where they land with regards to pace. Well, not really, is it? At least if you look online, I mean, there's just so many people that are complaining about the fact that these are terribly inaccurate. Now, let's take a small pause to look at whether it's fair to make that analysis or not. So the qualifying pace has been rolled out in the past three races, which was Bahrain, Sakir, and also Abu Dhabi. Now, the idea of artificial intelligence is that you have to watch out for what are called the outliers. Races where things that happen that are so far out of your control or there's not enough data to properly make a prediction on. So if you look at it from that perspective, AWS definitely had their hands full in the last triple header because of two key things. One was the introduction of a new circuit, which was SAC here, which there's absolutely zero data of a Formula One car running on. And then two, you have also the fact that several drivers were replaced. Russell had gone to Mercedes and then also you had Aitken taking his place at Williams and Fittipaldi taking Grosjean's place for the last two races actually so it certainly was something that was a big challenge for AWS to tackle. One of the big issues if you look at it is that a lot of people got frustrated with the fact that the predictions kept switching around because every time that you would have a new free practice session all these gaps would keep changing which again, in a model that is supposed to inspire confidence, it was definitely very confusing that at every free practice session, those qualifying pace numbers would be shifting dramatically as if the system didn't know what to predict and that it was just putting random numbers out there. At least that was the impression that was kind of put out to the viewers that actually followed the different free practice sessions as this was coming out. But let's take a moment to actually look into what was put together uh, on Bahrain and specifically because by Sakir and Abu Dhabi there were a couple of outliers there but Bahrain their very first uh, tryout with this information you were actually using a circuit that you had data on all the drivers were there and you had all the historical information from these past drivers and constructors uh, within the season to be able to put the seasonality estimates into play as well as pre previous free practice sessions not only in Bahrain in past years, since 2014, but also all of the free practice sessions, trends that you're trying to find and identify with throughout the year for these predictions. Now, one of the big things that I wanna talk about is that actually another great YouTube content creator, Chain Bear, did put a chart trying to compare the Bahrain results with the actual Q1 results and I think it was a great attempt at trying to pace whether that was correct or not and even though the pace was off by quite a bit then you still have to take into consideration that this was compared to Q1 results where all 20 cars ran but the reality of it is that in Q1 the teams that are constantly making it to Q3 are often known to not run at their full pace just, just yet because they're just trying to actually figure out what they want to do in terms of fine-tuning their setup as they start ramping up towards Q2 and then Q3. So it's, it's an interesting comparison, but you have to take it with a grain of salt because even though they got a lot of it wrong and they were off the pace by half a second in some examples, it was something that, comparing it to Q1, especially when you're looking farther up the ladder, it wasn't a really fair comparison 
to make in that situation. But that said, they did get a lot of it wrong as they're getting started with this, and the pace was off by quite a bit. And if you were looking even at more from a simplistic view where it's like, did they guess the positions correctly instead of the pace, then you also were disappointed because in several cases they were off by quite a bit. Probably not anytime soon, because one of the things that we've learned in trying to predict both qualifying and races is that predicting a race is exponentially more difficult to actually predict than qualifying. Qualifying is a very short three session period, about 10 to 15 minutes each, in order to be able to get your qualifying lap time everyone will likely participate and everyone will likely complete the session. So when you're talking about a race, you're having these outliers which can change drastically what a race is going to look like. So a couple of great examples is weather that can come mid-race and change a lot of things. The second thing is an accident or a safety car for whatever reason. If a safety car comes out, something as simple as your track position can dramatically change your outcome in the race. So uh, having wing damage and having to pit for a new wing as opposed to just pitting for new tires, all of that can change and that's something that you have to keep in mind and it becomes so much more difficult because it is almost impossible to predict when cars are going to collide. You certainly can do a lot of strides and we personally are actually working on to see how close we can get to a, an accurate prediction, but certainly it's not something that I think Formula One is gonna risk putting out there soon, especially with the amount of feedback that they're getting from the qualifying pace as it is. So it is important to note that there there are a lot of challenges with artificial intelligence and it's not a matter of just throw everything in the blender and let's see what artificial intelligence is going to spit out. There is a lot of fine tuning in your models to be able to get to better predictions, but it is interesting once you're putting this together, how much you're able to learn from race to race as you keep fine tuning your models. And anyone that follows uh, our channel, there's a couple of videos here. I'll probably try to post them here to uh, let you know how these AR models are built, but we're definitely gonna be looking at improving to see what can we learn, just like what Formula One teams can learn themselves from being able to analyze all of this data. Guys, I hope you liked the video that we put together here. Make sure to like and subscribe for the future videos we're gonna to put together for the winter 21 season. Uh, so that way we can try to do a couple of great analysis on driver versus driver, all the new team combos that we have, see who's gonna be predicted to do better before winter testing begins, and then maybe after if we can get that data and try to plot that winter testing data to see how we can predict uh, performance in the future. So once again, my name's Eric, this is R Squared Racing, and we'll catch you on the next video.